All right, we are opening the bylaw review, wetlands bylaw review meeting at um, 12.01 p.m. on April 29, 2022. All right, and I am eating my lunch while we do this. I'm sorry, but I'm otherwise I'm going to drop here. Um, <clears throat> so I guess I just wanted to check in overall as far as the meeting. Um, the upcoming hearing and how we sort of want to handle that. Um, so there's a couple things that I think are relevant. The first is the documents that we are going to discuss at the hearing are what I would describe as final draft. Um, I am still in the process, like the version that I sent you guys yesterday, I have to send to Kopelman and Page, the um, town attorney, have them give that last section a look over and there may be some other tweaks that Kopelman and Page recommends. Um, I know it's coming down to the wire, but this is like the only way I could do it. Um, he's already looked over all the other sections. So it's just this, the, the beast section, which is the, um, standards for inland wetlands. Um, so that's kind of a disclaimer. And um, I'm not sure, like early next week, there might be a couple tweaks to this section um, based on town attorney's comments. The other thing that is important for us to point out to the commission at that hearing is the fact that a lot of administrative edits need to be made to this, like Michelle pointed out last time, like science, some scientific names aren't um, uh, in italics. Um, also the, the references, like, so there are sections where there are references back to other sections. A lot of the section numbers have changed and I don't want to update all those section numbers and have us make more edits and then have those be wrong. So my plan would be to insert those final citations as like the last step basically in the edits. Um, my thinking as far as how to handle the hearing is to go section by section starting with section one and basically give, provide general bulleted information on these are the changes that were made. And I don't know as far as viewing the document, like I don't wanna sift through every single edit that was made to these documents. Um, if you go to the Conservation Commission page, um, in the left column all the way to the bottom, there's a link for um, <clears throat> the wetland bylaw regulation proposed amendments. And on there, I did um, the existing bylaw regulations section by section. Those are the ones that were amended in 2014. Then there's the proposed bylaw regulation amendments. And again, those are still sort of final draft under construction. There may be some other final edits that are made to those sections. And then there's the markups. And the markups are what? display all of the changes that were made between the 2014 amendment and the proposed amendment. So right now those are available for viewing. Um, I haven't <laughs> sent them to the entire commission yet because I kind of wanted to take a look at this particular section first with you guys before I sort of announce it and make it available to everybody on the commission and the public. Um, but yeah, I don't know if you guys have a better idea as far as like how to review this with the overall committee. Um, I was just thinking go through section by section and sort of broad brush. These are the changes that we made. Um, and these are the reasons that we made those changes um, as opposed to going change by change, edit by edit. Um, in general, <clears throat> Kind of like that approach. I got two questions on timeline. Uh, first is you say there'll probably be some lawyer tweaks early next week. Uh, is it possible for you to send Michelle and I just that section, section four, um, after the edit, but before the meeting? So maybe even Tuesday night, uh, Wednesday morning. Just yes. To have it. Yeah. Yep. And I'll I'll send um, the standard section to KP Law basically as soon as we get off the phone today, because I just want to make sure if you guys have any final things you want to add, we incorporate those now before I send them to KP. And once KP gets back to me with their comments, I'll send them to you. 
just make sure if you reply, don't reply all. <laughs> um, okay, so KP law. Okay, um, and I'll share the KP law markups if there are any back with you guys. Um, the other thing is, <clears throat> as far as this approach, and I think a good way maybe to keep it moving along is. Uh, if one of us, Michelle, if you have more interest, but I'm happy to do it, uh, come up with an essentially a, list, a series of slides for a PowerPoint that actually have bullet point statements on them that reference the general changes per section. Uh, that keeps us away from going through anything in detail, but keeps it open enough that if people have questions, we will have time to drill down. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And I think that's a fantastic idea, Leroy. Um, and I want to make this really easy for you and Michelle. So do you want me to put a framework for a PowerPoint together? Or is that something you guys want to do? Because I just want to support you as staff and do something to kind of help you get the ball rolling if I can. Um, if not, I'm happy, to t I'm happy to take a back seat and let you guys do it. Uh, Michelle, any thoughts? I mean, <laughs> I would greatly appreciate you leading that. Um, OK. I, th I think that, well, I don't know like what kind of, um, you know, general overall handle that you have on creating that PowerPoint, but may, um, maybe like a framework from Aaron just in, in Word to then, I don't know, are you ready to do that right now, Leroy, or do you need? Um, like, I could be ready to put some slides together and send them over to Erin. She can just put them together in a quick presentation, I think. Should okay. Be Great. Yes, whatever you. You know, formatting and backgrounds are best for the town <clears throat> in public presentation. Yeah, so I do have a little time on Monday and Tuesday, and I can definitely help with that. Um, I'm happy to go whatever direction makes sense. Like, Leroy, if you want to put some ideas together and send me what you have by, like, if you can by Monday, and if I don't get anything from you, or if I do, I can start to just assemble stuff a little bit too. Um, and then we can say, yeah, let's aim for it. I'll get you something by Monday morning, and okay. let's, I'll go section by section. So at the very least, you'll have a few sections to start with. Perfect. Yeah. But you <laughs> Wonderful. can get something Monday morning. Yeah, that's great. That's a great idea. I like the PowerPoint idea. That like that actually takes kind of a load off my shoulders a little bit because I was kind of, I mean, it's it seems so simple, but it's you know it's so overwhelming for me to think about it at this point. Um, just because I'm. No, so it's a great idea. It. Thank you, Leroy. That way, like, sort of the the changes are going to be visually presented and not just up to Erin to recount it and everybody to remember what she said. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, so, and it, and um, oh, CC you, Michelle, on those points, or is that legal, Erin? No, no, just copy me, um, just send them to me. And uh, we can, you and I can kind of sort out um, finalizing them. And then once we have something sort of semi-final, I'll just send that out to everybody in advance of the meeting, similar to what I do with our regular ConCom PowerPoint presentation so people can look at it a little bit beforehand. Um, it might actually be a good idea too, now that you're, now that I'm sort of thinking about this, um, to just include a slide that says, on such and such date, we started the bylaw review committee meeting, we started meetings on this day, and we held them every Friday at noon, you know, and just kind of give a little update. And this is where the meetings are located. Uh, if you want to view them, you know, just to give some, some of that background history of like how this all started. And actually, it might even be good to just explain that those these edits have been in the works for before I even arrived. They were like 800 markups from others yeah. in town before That's I a, even... I, I think back. like the contributors of the edits, like a list yeah. of the contributors is good so that everybody knows that it wasn't just this one bylaw review yep. committee. And yeah, yep. yep. Probably you should put the list of reviewers, right? In, yeah. In their, in their titles. I'll put the I'll put the historic slide together with information on kind of what was handed to me and who made those edits before it came to me and then the process of setting up the committee and then Leroy if you want to just focus on the changes section by section and then I can add and modify that if needed. Um, okay, that sounds like a good approach. Okay, um, can I just clarify are we attempting to get through this entire. I mean there's one meeting to discuss the entire 
um, revision? Okay. No, nope. Um, okay. So the intention is the hearing will be opened on uh, May 4th. And, and on May 4th, we would give that historical context, I guess that sounds good, then start with section one going through what our edits were and why, and go section by section. There's five sections, the last section there was no changes to, so it'll really just be reviewing the four sections. The That will be sort of an introduction and a general overview of changes. And then from there, we're gonna continue that public hearing to May 11th, There'll be a hearing on the May 11th general CONCOM meeting. And that I think should be more for public input. Um, and we'll set aside like a 20 minute or a half an hour block for public comment um, on the changes. And then the same goes for the May 25th meeting. Um, so it gives three public hearings over the course of the month of May to give feedback. And we can also tell people that they can submit written feedback as well. They could, you know, send us an email with their comments or suggestions or whatever. Okay, so then our special meeting will be primarily to present this to the rest of the commission and get their input. And, and yep. with the idea of getting through the whole thing and then leaving other sessions open for public comment on that. Yeah, and if we don't get through the whole thing, then we can just handle it at a later meeting. Um, that might there may there may be happen. people we may want to set aside 20 minutes during that hour too for public comment because i'm sure there will mm -hmm. be okay thank you mm -hmm. um procedurally on those meetings i think jen asked the other day if i would be open to leading them i said i would be happily but then i was thinking about it i'm a co-chair there but michelle you're actually the chair here so i didn't mean to trample on your toes if you want to leave those meetings by all means <laughs> Um, no worries. I think you're well suited to it as, I mean, I can do it here. If you want me to, Leroy, I will, but, um, we can transition to the, um, hierarchy for our normal meetings. You well, you guys could it. also split it up, you know, one of you. Can <laughs> sure, sections, I'm sure I'll have something to other. say. <laughs> um, no, I'm fine with that, Leroy, yeah. if, if you are, if you're interested. Uh, yeah, I don't think there will be much for you to worry about procedurally. Uh, they should be pretty tight meetings. The real concern will be the two that are aimed at public. It's going to be mostly just keeping those people concise. <laughs> yeah. Y yes. Yep. Um, and yeah, I mean, I know that there are going to be people who are probably not impressed with all the changes, but um, I also, you know, sort of look at it from the standpoint of this is the job we're tasked with and it's our job to protect wetlands and that's the purpose of this. Um, it's not, there's no other purpose other than that. So just to remind people of that. And and that- Hold actually, on, go ahead. Um, Laura, you will be leading it though. Did we just decided it confirmed that, that you- uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> that actually, I just, as we were talking about, as I was talking, it might actually be a good idea to also include a slide that explains what the regulations are. <laughs> like, we have a bylaw, the town has a bylaw, and the regulations are what administer the bylaw and just give people that information and explain, this is like the home rule authority, this is the version of the, basically the Wetland Protection Act is state law, and this is local law. So it's clear to people kind of what we're doing and why. Um, yeah, I'll just make a note of that. Um, Probably do that at each of the sessions, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay. Well, if do we, is there anything else like sort of administrative that we want to talk about before we look at this last section? Um, I guess what I didn't have time to review the entire like 40 pages, but just to <laughs> confirm the, um, like I did see sort of editorial errors and, you know, like spacing, spelling, and, but those are going to be handled like separately parallel to the content. I mean, yeah. I just, I didn't, I was like getting a little caught up in it, but um, I'm just kind of confirming that there'll be some review just for on that level, or do we need to discuss that today too? Yeah. Um, that's or, or I could review it if, and send you some edits. If you also. want to send me markups, that would be helpful. Okay. 
Um, Are you the one that would have to do just like the editorial review? Okay. Well, yeah, I'm happy but, to. But the thing is, I. Oh, and the other thing was, I forgot to. I forgot to mention this. I am also going to send this specific section to Emily Stockman because she was the one who provided me the guidance, particularly on the vernal pool sections um, and and the isolated land subject to flooding delineation guidelines. So I'm going to send this to her as well as KP Law and get both of their feedback and incorporate any changes if I can early in the week. But I'll send you the changes from both those folks. Um, but uh, so Michelle, maybe hold off on the okay administrative stuff. But I think to your point, it needs to be made clear, this is still a working document. And so if anybody finds issues with any specific part of the document, it should be clear, like a lot of the administrative things are going to be cleaned up. This is really just looking at the content. Um, okay, so final in terms of content, not necessarily editorial review. Right. And I'm hoping by the end of May, those versions will be cleaned up. Okay, great. Administratively. Yes. And we can take a we can take a couple stabs at that once we get sort of the content portion. Okay. Great. Right. So we will focus on content and that sounds like a good plan. Okay. All right. So is it okay if I jump into let's do it. Okay. Okay. Uh can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so <clears throat> Jen um, Fair, I had actually asked her to write the preamble for the bank section, um, similar to what Leroy did, which by the way, Leroy, I took a look at um, your land underwater section and it looked great. So that was awesome. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, I asked Jen if she could take a stab at this because Jen being a hydrologist, I just thought, oh gosh, the, the bank section, she would really, she would really do a phenomenal job on. Um, she said she was going to try to get me edits by today, but in the off chance that she doesn't have time, what I did was, um, this, I'm sorry, Ooh. um, this is from the Wetlands Protection Act, um, and that's kind of a, fallback just to use the Wetland Protection Act preamble. Um, and if we, if Jen does provide updates, I'll plug those updates in here into this section, just basically outlining the interests that um, each section uh, aims to protect, okay? Can you just please um, turn, so the, the species name, scientific name for rainbow trout, this, the, G, the species should be in lowercase. <laughs> Sorry, I can't, can't let that go. I know wherever, yeah, just turn that to a small M. <laughs> That's, I'll stop there. That was from Wetland Protection Act. That was an error really? in the act, yeah. Right. Pretty funny, they should have gotten you an edit. Actually, I found a bunch of edits in the Wetland Protection Act while I was doing this. Um, errors, I mean, I found a bunch of errors, okay. Okay, so going down the line, I'm just going to go through page by page. Um, so there was no change from existing regulations with regard to the definition and critical characteristics. Um, we may have talked about this before. This edit here was basically just to clarify because it was not clear before that um, the previous iteration of the regulations didn't mention riverfront at all um, in this section. And so now it is clear that land within 100 feet of bank of an intermittent stream, as well as land within 200 feet of the bank of a perennial stream, i.e. riverfront is likely to be significant. So that change was incorporated. Um, I know previous in previous sessions when we reviewed this section, I've mentioned to you that several of the sections took some of the performance standards from the Wetlands Protection Act, but not all of them. So what I did here was I made this section consistent with the Wetland Protection Act. Um, however, it also includes the additional performance standards um, that are applicable under the local bylaw. So it's not like 
for whatever reason, there was like certain ones from the Wetland Protection Act that were included, but others were left off. They're all included now with the additional two sections from our local, local regs. Um, this subsection, uh, the preamble for boarding vegetated wetlands I wrote based, and this was based on some of the, um, I believe the Tyner article, the Tyner paper that I read, I um, fashioned this. So this subsection was completely rewritten. I'm completely open to any changes to this is more or less just to um, have a little bit more comprehensive preamble and also because we have additional interests under our local bylaw that um, the Wetland Protection Act doesn't have. And so that's why I wanted to adjust our preamble to address those additional interests. Again, the definition here made consistent with the Wetland Protection Act. Um, I don't like the fact that we had a different definition under our local bylaw than under the Wetland Protection Act, and also a more loose definition under our local bylaw than under the Wetland Protection Act. That's not how it's supposed to be. Um, they should be consistent. The, the same delineation criteria should be do, being completed for resource areas that are the same under both our bylaw and the Wetland Protection Act. So that's exactly what, what was done here. This is a cut and paste from the Wetland Protection Act with the exception of these ones at the bottom that are um, uh, additional. And these address um, previously altered areas, previously altered wetlands, um, similar to like that site out on Montague Road where there was like agricultural use had altered it. Um, no change from existing regulations for the presumption section. Okay, um, general performance standards for BVW. Um, I, this is again made consistent with the Wetland Protection Act with the exception of where underlined. So um, in the town of Amherst, and this is not a change from the previous bylaws. Um, so under Wetland Protection Act, it's one-to-one -one replication. So if they're filling one square foot of wetland, they have to replicate one square foot. In the town of Amherst, if you fill one square foot, you have to replicate two square feet. So that's what that double that um, underlined takes into account. Uh, I just have a question there about um maybe consistency and how we're denoting differences between the Wetlands Protection Act and, and the bylaw. So we had sort of discussed asterisks, asterisks, which I don't think is appropriate anymore because there's so much um, integration into the section. So that's one thing I think we should remove the asterisks. It's just sort of confusing, but is Shelby double that? Are you underlying it for emphasis or to call out um, the one difference and then otherwise? Okay. I, Cause we don't do that everywhere. So I'm just bringing up the, mm -hmm. um, like, why is this the only underlying text in the whole thing at this point? So the general format of this section is cut and paste from the Wetland Protection Act at the top. And then the bylaw specific sub, you know, subsections are below that. The reason I underlined that was because that's actually an edit to the text that I copied and pasted from the Wetlands Protection Act. And I wanted to just call that out in the version that we're reviewing. So that's clear. Um, I'm open to keeping that in the permanent version just to highlight it for people. Um, and I totally hear your point with regard to calling out the bylaw specific um, performance standards, for example. Um, I guess I'm just not sure how to do that consistently without it being sort of like disruptive to the overall document. Um, because like, for example, with an asterisk, it's 
it's difficult because it might just be a really sm small change, just a couple words, like in this case, just that those four words are the only difference. Right. And so putting an asterisk there gives the indication that there might be a more substantive change. And it's literally just those four words. So um, yeah, I agree that it could be disruptive. I'm just, so I guess this is the first time that I'm thinking we've underlined something. So I'm just wondering, should we keep that in mind for other specific and <laughs> significant exceptions mm -hmm. to a state? We can keep going. I'm just, I'm just sort of acknowledging that we've used a, a formatting for like to signify something that we haven't really been doing throughout the rest of the document. Mm -hmm. That's all. Mm -hmm. but we can keep going. Yeah, I'll keep that in mind. And um, I might ask Emily what her thoughts are on that. Um, so this is the only condition or the only performance standard that was specific to our regulations. And this came from the previous iteration of the regs. So just to point that out. Um, Well, ex actually this one down here. Um, and this is, this is one is pretty important because it refers to stormwater structures. Okay, <clears throat> so. Isolated wetlands and vernal pools. Um, I forgot an asterisk there. Um, uh, so, I thought, I'm sorry, but just thinking about it. And the risk of lengthening it by a line, could we not change that underlined portion to keep it the original uh, Wetlands Protection Act and then add a second line at the end of that section that says, in the town of Amherst, that square footage is doubled or something along those lines? Because that makes it pretty clear. No, I mean, it would be a, maybe 1A or maybe number eight to put that line in? Um, or can we just add in the town of Amherst to number one or something? Or that could work, yeah. Or under the town bylaws or? Something like that. Yeah. I think that would work better than putting it lower down. I'm just concerned that it won't be clear that it's tied back to that particular um, number one if we put it lower down. Totally agree, yep. Okay. So that would allow us to un underline, to take away yep. the underline. <laughs> it seems, I don't know, it seems maybe menial, but it's just, um, it's like a convention that we haven't used throughout, so it. So is it okay? Would you guys mind if I just keep it underlined until sure. we get to our sure. final? I mean, until we present it to the overall board. It's just that the reason is so that for for me to keep it clear in my own mind. Um, but I'll the section that's up on the website. I'm not sure if it's even underlined, but I'll double check that mm -hmm. and the version that we use, the clean version that's on the website. I won't underline it. I just want to make sure that when folks are reviewing it, that that's called out specifically. Um, like KP and, and Emily and myself, but I will- That point too, Mich I'm sorry, go ahead. I said, I'll, right. I'll, I'll take, remove the underline in the final draft version. Uh, to your point, Michelle, it is manual, but when you're, if you're just a lay person reading this and it is the only underlined thing, the nature of the line almost makes it feel punitive. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe so, that's what I was yeah. feeling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I agree. It's, I like I like Leroy's. Um, yeah. Edit. Okay. Okay. Um, let me just you guys. Um, okay. <clears throat> so, just to point this out, this change. The previous version of the um, standards, bordering vegetated wetlands and isolated vegetated wetlands were in one section together. I removed, 
isolated vegetated wetlands from the bordering section and put it in its own section along with vernal pools. For me, that made it much clearer and um, more, um, more distinctive that there, there was a lot of problems with bordering and isolated being combined together in one section. <laughs> this section, this preamble section was rewritten to account for, for that. And these resource areas are not resource areas listed in the Wetlands Protection Act per se. There, there are references to these, these, but they're not considered to be resource areas unless they're not subject to protection unless they're located in a different resource area. So for example, a vernal pool would only be regulated if it was in riverfront or if it was within isolated land subject or isolated land subject to flooding. That's the only way that the vernal pool would be regulated. Um, under the Wetlands Protection Act. Under the Wetlands Protection Act. Because it's right. still ACOE. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So <laughs> my preamble for this one's a little long and my protections on this section are a little more sort of assertive, I guess I would say. Um, based on the advice, and I know we touched on this quickly with the last meeting, based on the advice of Emily Stockman, the definition of isolated, or I shouldn't say, that, so it's under definition, it's basically the same isolated vegetated wetlands versus bordering vegetated wetlands. The difference being bordering vegetated wetlands border on something, isolated ones do not, but the delineation um, guidelines are the same as far as vegetation, soils, hydrology. Okay, so it, there's a section A, which describes how to delineate isolated vegetated wetlands. And then there's section B that talks about how to delineate a vernal pool. And the vernal pool delineation criteria came from um, the certification criteria from the Mass Division of Fisheries and Wildlife. So I took their form and basically put it into this format. Um, and Michelle, this is one section I would really like for you, the, just this section B, for you to take a really hard look at in terms of like, if you were going out to delineate this, would this make sense to you? Um, and is there anything loophole that I like missed in here as far as um, delineating it? Okay, um, just quickly then, you basically copy this from the criteria for vernal pool certification from Mass Wildlife, right? Like I'm like slightly familiar with how to certify a vernal pool. So this is the criteria that they use, so. Well, yes, but the formatting is different. Like okay. they have it in a, um, it's like a more of a, uh, landscape view sort of, um, uh, it's got, um, oh, what do you want, how do I describe this? Like a, um, almost like a table. It's in like a tabular format. And actually I did put it in the research folder, which I haven't uploaded to the um, OneDrive, but it's a, it's like in a, um, a tabular format of how it's done. So the, the format of it is like, I had to, formatted a little differently to get it into this regulatory format. Um, okay. If that makes I'm sense. I'm happy to take a look at that. Okay. That'd be great. And that continues down here onto this second page. I just didn't, when I put in the comment, it didn't highlight that. I just um, also wanted to express that I think it is reasonable that this is longer than the other sections because it's specific to Amherst. It probably deserves, I, know, I just support that you've been thorough with it because we are deviating a bit. Um, I think it deserves a lot of clear explanation. Well, the previous section of the regs, it was not clear. And, yeah. and also the guidance was confusing to people. And so I feel like, like, for example, people <clears throat> thought that 
uh, vernal pool was a subsection of an isolated wetland. So that if it didn't meet the definition of isolated, it wasn't a vernal pool. And so this way it breaks it out into two separate sections to make that clear. So it's not a subsection of isolated. It actually has its own definition and its own you know, guidelines for delineation. <clears throat> um, presumptions, this section was completely rewritten. And this was based on that paper, in, based in part on that paper you sent me, Michelle. Excuse me. Okay. <clears throat> These general performance standards were taken from the vernal pool performance standards on the last version of the regulations, but I did edit them. So for example, I included shall not, <laughs> to be clear from a regulatory standpoint. I also included or the setback determined to be appropriate by the Conservation Commission to protect said wetland. So if, for example, the commission was reviewing a given project and said 100 feet is not enough to protect this isolated wetland or this vernal pool, that is in there. Um, it could also I, go the other way. I'm just pointing that out. That's true. That's true. If if it's like you know highly degraded or something, and the commission and it was like in the middle of town, the commission you know <laughs> could determine that it should have a smaller. Um, and that's an important distinction, especially when people bring up um, a complaint about that. <laughs> it's an important thing to point out. Uh, okay. Here we go. This is Leroy's section. Thank you, Leroy. This looked great. And I don't, oh yeah, I kept the headers. Okay. Um, so uh, definition here is the same as wetland protection and the bylaw regulations. That didn't change, I don't believe. Um, kept the presumption from wetland protection and added the additional, because under our regulations, isolated land subject to flooding um, also has a hundred foot buffer, which it doesn't have, or I'm sorry, isolated vegetated wetlands have a hundred foot buffer, which does not have under wetland protection. Okay, <laughs> so um, land under water bodies and waterways. Um, this is one of the sections is really bizarre. There was only a there was only like three or four performance standards. All of the rest of the performance standards in the Wetland Protection Act were left off of it. And I don't know why that was, but at this at this juncture, they're added back in. Um, so all of the performance standards under well and protection are there. Okay, so this is another. Um, I hope I'm getting this right. In the previous iteration of the bylaw regulations, land bordering land subject to flooding and isolated land subject to flooding were two separate sections. I incorporated them together. And the reason I did that is because that's how it's how they are in the Wetlands Protection Act. And I'm trying to make our bylaw as consistent with the Wetland Protection Act as possible um, from the standpoint of definitions and resource area sections. Um, and it was just confusing to me that they were separated and also sort of duplicative in a way because they're like, the same resource area is just one's boarding and one's isolated. And they're both referenced in the Wetland Protection Act. So it just made sense for them to be grouped together here in my mind anyway. Um, this is another section where uh, I took the preamble from the Wetland Protection Act. And part of it was a symptom of the time <laughs> that I had available. Um, and also because it's broken out into two separate um, preambles in the Wetland Protection Act. And it's, um, so I felt safe doing that. Again, it's not as um, crafted for the town of Amherst specific um, interests. And if I had a little more time, I would have liked to have 
done each of them individually, but I just didn't have that time. So there, these are basically placeholders. If we end up having more time to wordsmith Amherst specific preamble, we can do that. But if we don't, the Wetland Protection Act preambles there. Um, I just saw something about isolated wetlands subject to flooding, including, okay, so um, the distinction with that and vernal pools. So this is important because if a vernal pool, okay, so <laughs> this is really important. And, and this is something that, you know, I'm always learning in this job, but this is something that's extremely important. Anytime we have a vernal pool, it should also be referenced as isolated land subject to flooding. Okay, so so a vernal pool is isolated land subject to flooding, but isolated land subject to flooding isn't also a vernal pool. That's confusing. Well, but hold on. I a guess second. It works. hold on. A second. I yeah. I mean, the the bottom line is protection, right? Because yeah. you don't want it to be filled because it's holding floodwaters um, that could be displaced and end up somewhere else. So hold that thought, Michelle, um, because there is a section of this that may have been a little bit of an overreach on my part, and I just want to have you guys give me your opinion on it. <clears throat> this section previously only contained a portion of the Wetland Protection Act definition. I edit it to include the entire Wetland Protection Act definition, and I edited it where underlined. So these are the sections that I wanted you to read here in particular. The Conservation Commission shall consider and regulate all vernal pools as certified under these regulations. That's the first thing. The second is the boundary of vernal pool habitat is as defined by these regulations. Okay, so I just wanted to make sure that that was that was yeah. Exactly. So, um, KAP law will read that, especially the underlying. I don't know if that's the mm -hmm. the wording because we we can't certify them, but I guess the point is that we consider them and evaluate them as if they were certified, right? So, mm -hmm. as long as they and our criteria for delineation are the same as certification. So that holds a higher standard to identifying them. Yeah, I guess as long as they review that and it's clear that we're not, I, I'm, it just seems could be sticky, like um, that, that we consider them as certified. Um, not that we're, anyway. Um, well, because if they're not I think certified, it's fine. they're just, not a vernal pool. Right, we, we will regulate them under the assumption, like based on the criteria of being a certified burn pool. I, I don't know. I think it could just use a review by the law. Okay. I'm sure they'll submit us some comments. Okay, so this is another one here, a couple underlined here. Vernal pools and isolated vegetated wetlands that hold any volume of water are by default also considered to be isolated land subject to flooding. Okay, there's the solid statement I was asking about, yep. And then isolated land subject to flooding shall be presumed to be vernal pool habitat. The Conservation Commission may use its discretion in determining an area is not vernal pool habitat with a clear showing of evidence from the applicant that the area does not meet the definition of a vernal pool. Does that come at this? <laughs> Does that clarify some of your question a little bit? Let me just think for a second. Um, yep. I'm going to eat while you think. I mean, so essentially, it's putting the burden of proof on the applicant to show that it's in no way a vernal pool. So, mm -hmm. um, we as assume unless proven otherwise that a you know depression subject to flooding could serve at some yearly interval as vernal pool habitat right. unless there's and clear evidence to show otherwise yeah 
Right. I mean, I, I think mean, that's a good conservative um, statement. It should be pretty easy to prove it's not a vernal pool, like if it has an outlet, you know, or if it has fish in it or whatever. Well, I mean, soil hydrology. Um, I mean, this is something that we've talked about before, like proving something is a vernal pool requires like some tie in with um, the ecology, the, bio, the biological component, which makes it a vernal pool. So that can be hard, you know, in year three of a drought when the pool hasn't been active for a while. Um, right. Well, and the other thing is, I mean, and I, I spent a lot of time thinking about this section. It's like there, the criteria for um, delineating a vernal pool is pretty specific and pretty mm -hmm. comprehensive. And so is it fair to then assume that it's a vernal pool by default? To me, the criteria would be, you know, if a credible a credible person was to submit information. And I mean, maybe we want to add some time of year requirement for that information. Like it has to be evaluated in the spring to confirm that it's not or something like that. Um, I, I mostly don't want to create a situation where something is comes in as in a, in a delineation as isolated land subject to flooding. And then we find out later it was a vernal pool but we didn't know it was. We, so in this case, we would assume it is until information is presented to us that it's not. I don't know. I'm kind of, that one's a little. You know, I, yeah, I think that is safe. Um, it's because just the way information is presented to us and the you know, speed at which we need to consider it, I think, I'd, I'd prefer to err on giving the burden of proof to the applicant. But as far as like, you know, timing, I don't, I have to read about like certification, whether mass fish and wildlife, do they have a time of year certification? Uh, like, is it, is it reasonable no, but a lot to of the make... biological indicators aren't going to be in there? And I mean, unless you right. come across, um, like you said, like exoskeletons or something. Um, so is it reasonable to make an applicant wait like the course of a year to prove that that is not a vernal pool? We have in the past. Okay. We have in the past. I mean, we had a two year hearing at one point for trying to capture that window. Um, and well, we ended up determining it was a vernal pool at the end of the day. That's good context. Um, yeah, I think it's pretty hard to show outside of the season, you know, but I have, I don't, I don't know, maybe you could just confirm that with your vernal pool expert if she thinks that it's possible, I guess, you know, under conditions where maybe it doesn't fill every year, but every other year, 50% of the time, if it's in an off year, can you still determine like the biological indicators or is it important to wait until spring? Leroy, I'm curious of your take on that, on this. I guess I'm just listening. Right? I can't offer any good solutions, but I have the same feeling as Michelle, which is that um, it seems like undue burden. And I also have a question okay. about undue cost to applicants. But so far, I, I don't really see that as a concern. Um, because, like you said, it seems like if it were easy to prove, any common person could come in and say, hey, there's an outlet here. Uh, as difficulty increases, you would need a more credentialed person, and that's when cost increases. But, again, that's with difficulty of permits, so I'm all right with that. The, the year, though, it's just tough to get around. I mean, you're absolutely right, Michelle. You, the certain season to prove it, uh, but we don't want to wait. I don't know. I mean, yeah, it, it seems unfortunate that, you know, if it was happened to be a dry year that we'd have to say you have to wait an entire year. But if there's precedent for that, 
I also don't think it's, you know, reasonable to just because it's the fall and there doesn't seem to be any biological indicators, um, we're going to allow complete filling or modification of it. Um, whereas it could be an, a vernal pool and we just didn't know because of the season. I, I just feel like we need a little expert opinion on that one. If it's, you know, is it possible to delineate a vernal pool outside of the um, wet season? Well, the other thing is, as this is the grant, we have a permit come in, they want to do whatever within a certain space. Whether or not we come to find out it actually is burning a pool shouldn't matter that much, right? I mean, it's going to be isolated land subject to flooding. It has its own protection, so yeah. The setback would be different, right? It is would be different, different? The, yeah. the setback would be different, but-, but so I guess my point is how to put this. Uh, it would only change applicants who are really uh, particular or trying to really work right up into that limit. Uh, most of our permits are people uh, wanting to know where things are, or they already know where they are, and they're issuing work plans that aren't even approaching that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So functionally, it only affects a very few cases, and those are the cases we actually do want to keep an eye on, which are people approaching right up to the limits of things. So. Right. So I did so make in that way. I do kind of agree with the, you know, time of year, and we can make people wait. Okay, that's a good point. I mean, honestly, as someone with an ecology background, I support time of year to be certain. I mean, our, our mandate is to protect a wetland and how can we be sure it is or not a vernal pool necessarily. But again, like I would, you know, if, if you have another towns that like have other towns done that, and also I guess just confirming with someone that does these, <clears throat> if it's, it's my understanding that vernal pools are certified in wet seasons because that's when the biology is happening. So if that's the criteria for certifying a vernal pool, I think there should probably be a time, a seasonality on evaluating its, its uh, status as one. Okay. And double down on that too, if we're trying to keep it as much in line with the state as possible, we should probably hear what Mass Fish and Wildlife has to say about certification. So I did add a little bit of wordsmithing here while you guys were talking it out. I said, if isolated land subject to flooding has observed physical criteria and characteristics of a vernal pool, it shall be presumed to be vernal pool habitat. So that means like if there's no outlet, so physical criteria being mostly no outlet or connectivity with like a fish bearing water body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm I fine with that, but I, I do think we should make sure we revisit the seasonality here, um, especially in here with where the burden of proof is stated that- um, Form of lack of biological criteria. Okay, so the commission may use its discretion in determining an area as not vernal pool habitat with a clear showing of evidence in the form of. I don't know if we want to add that, Erin. Um, a lack of biological criteria from the applicant. I, I think. Um, I think it'd be too easy just to show like a dried up basin with no biological criteria in it. Um, can we just refer to our wetland or vernal pool standards because it's all sort of laid out what we consider to be vernal pool there. Can we do like in parentheses section blah blah blah. So um, I just want to go back to because we were just talking about the seasonal um, requirement yeah. for checking it and I was going to add that in here. Um, but if you want to just refer to the section, we can do that. But I was going to say, if we're going to um, add in the time of year, I think we need to say a clear show um, that there's a lack of biological criteria during the spring vernal pool season or something to that effect. <clears throat> do we have um, 
a seasonality component to a rental pool section, that section B. No. Oh, yeah. We, we probably should there if we're going to go with this. Um, in which case, can we just refer back to that section and not like sort of like commission may use its discretion in determining areas not a rental pool habitat. Uh, if um, like definitions of vernal pool as like however you say it. Definition of like vernal pool or something like that. And yeah, I would put the citate like the section. Yeah. yeah. yeah I'll do enter citation. Um, Yeah, I mean, in general, I think like being really detailed, spelling out our definitions and criteria and then referring back to that is probably better than trying to restate it in a different okay. place. So because we just talked about the seasonality thing, I want to go back up to yeah, that for section sure. and revisit that because this is super important right now. Um, um, <clears throat> I feel like this would be the place to enter this something and Michelle or Leroy, if you have recommendation for how to word this something to the effect of um, biological criteria are uh, only identifiable. Right. Criteria must be observed during the uh, wet season. Like, I, I don't know, I can look up for language like the inundation period or like, um, yeah, the wet season and, and inundation. I, I mean, spring I mean, is I important. Know, I know vernal pool, vernal pool, um, let me just mass division of fish and wildlife, vernal pool season. I know that- timing, I look to you, Michelle. It, it shouldn't really be all wet seasons just whenever it's wet, right? It really should be spring specifically. Yeah, I guess so. Like, Erin, you were looking for a month, like a... Yeah, I mean, I know Emily Stockman could advise on that. Like, she's told me in the past, I believe it's between, like, May 1st and June 30th. It's definitely earlier than May 1st, because I was looking at vernal pools and, like... Maybe I mean, it's April 15th. Earlier. Yeah, we. Can, I think we can find that, but if you... Yeah, that, that must be a placeholder. And I also, I don't want to say April 15th, but maybe more like April, like just to make us have some longevity with, you know, climate changes and yeah. rain patterns and everything. So maybe I'll say like March 30th to June 30th. or something. Ah, uh, or June 15th, because <laughs> they're usually dried up by then. Um, I'll put this in here and I'll ask. Um, Great, thank you. I'll ask. Okay, I'm. I feel good. I'm much better about this. Um, okay. Me too. If it does end up being that window, I mean, it does reduce burden to applicants significantly. It's a quarter of the year. Yeah. Um, okay, but here's the thought: if they're dried up by June fifteenth, you're not going to see necessarily. Will you see egg masses in mid June? Like if we, I don't know, I would really like to refer to an expert on this one, like okay. when the window is to sort of buy a vernal pool because okay. too early and they won't be active too. And you know, that gives, um, I don't know, maybe like, you know, you can, a pool can become active on a single night and that single night is corresponding to like a rain fall and temperatures over 50. So that might not happen until April 7th. So if the certification is done or the survey is done April 1st and those conditions haven't happened yet, there's going to be no indicators in the pool. So I'm almost thinking there should be clarification about um, like we do know specific conditions where amphibians become active 
and it's not necessarily a date, it's actually like um, rainfall and temperature. So if we can be, I feel like our window then could be more specific to the biological um, activity of a vernal pool and less about people's scheduling a consultant to go out there on a certain day. What I'm gonna do uh -huh. is I'm gonna ask Emily, I'm gonna call her when we're done here and ask her for a recommendation on that. Like That's great. Add, add that language and then and then once I make that edit, I'll send it out to them because I think that's a really important, really important Okay, thank thing. you. Yeah. I'm excited to see what she says because when I used to be a sprayer at Michelle in Massachusetts anyway, a lot of the regs do reference growing degree dates, GDD, instead of any mm. dates. So yeah. there's probably a system for this. So I'm excited, but we'll figure right. it out. And then we don't have to make our window move around with climate change it just it's the conditions are right then we can assume the biology will move along with it mm -hmm. okay all right i think that that's good i'm gonna keep moving is that okay <laughs> okay all right so i just want to come back to where we were a second ago <laughs> I just wanted to observe physical criteria and characteristics. Criteria. I'm going to take out in characteristics of a vernal pool. It shall be presumed to be vernal pool habit that the commission may use its discretion in determining if an area is not a vernal pool with clear showing of evidence from the applicant that the area does not meet the definition of a vernal pool. See definition of vernal pool and enter citation. Okay. So I think that I think that covers it if we have the time of year requirement in the definition. Or the um, temperature and rainfall criteria. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. Presumptions from Wetland Protection Act, general performance standards, mostly from Wetland Protection Act, with the exception of these couple at the bottom, which were taken from our existing bylaw. And then these ones were taken from the Wetland Protection Act. Okay, <laughs> so now we get to the now we get to the really fun part. Um, yeah, you guys aren't sharing my my excitement. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so riverfront was specifically is specifically called out in our bylaw as being a protected resource area, but it was never listed in our standards as a resource area, which makes no sense to me at all. There was literally no riverfront in here and it has been an issue time and time again for applicants claiming there's no riverfront requirement under our bylaw. So at the advice of town council, town attorney, excuse me, not town council, town attorney, I've added in the entire Wetlands Protection Act Preamble, definition, characteristics. Um, okay, <clears throat> so I'm just gonna stop right here because this is uh, definitions. You will see, please note under section three, that if the commission is presented with evidence from a credible source that a watershed size of a stream is greater than a half square mile, it shall determine the stream to be perennial. We're dealing with an appeal right now where oh. these hmm. issues are at question. And so this gives the commission the ability to deem the stream perennial locally if it's a half square mile size of watershed period. So I added that in. So that's one change from the state to us in the riverfront section. Um, very long section. This is why this section is so long, um, almost 40 pages, because this huge section got added in, but also very, very important section. Um, <clears throat> so it's very long, lots of, lots and lots and lots of performance standards are within this section. And, um, 
other than where my only big question there would be was there any reasoning behind why it wasn't in there before did they believe it was captioned under another standard my suspicion is that it was an oversight and or whomever was drafting it it was strategic Fair. but tough to tell I think it was more strategic in my opinion, but um, okay. Um, so that's um, that's that. And I I did read through here trying to take out some of the statewide references. Um, there was a couple references to um, other river basins, and you know that is another section that would benefit from a more critical read through. I mean, I know this stuff is like thrilling to read you guys, but it would really benefit from like a solid set of eyes looking at it and saying, oh wait, you forgot. There's like the Housatonic is referenced in here or something. Um, I did try to read it. I literally spent like multiple hours yesterday skimming through this and reading it and taking sections out, but taking references to other parts of the state out, um, taking references to coastal out um, coastal waterways and stuff like that but again um, there are you be... asking us to look at it Aaron okay <laughs> can I just write so it's the riverfront standard the, section the, yeah the, the entire riverfront section really okay. can benefit from a, a very critical read through um, <clears throat> And then we get back to buffer zones, which brings us back to some of the changes. We've reviewed these previously, but just to make sure this is the direction we wanna go, I did add in this section from Northampton, which I feel like is a very important section. I tried, this section, I tried to look at other towns in our region that are similar to Amherst. And my observation is that Amherst or that other towns have more stringent buffer zone standards than we do. And I wanted to make our buffer zone a little stronger. That's why I incorporated these changes um, to only allow up to 20% of the area between 50 and 100 feet. It was 50% it was before? What was it? No. Nope. There was no percentage requirement no. before. This is no. a completely new section. This was taken from the Northampton regs. And part of the reason why it's 50 to 100 feet is because I created a 50 foot no touch, which again, other people might not agree with, um, but that is a new section here. And then I did add, because we had had some discussion about like, well, that's a little strict. And what about if it's in like a downtown area where, it's like heavily developed. And so I did add in this um, sentence, exceptions can be made on a case by case basis in redevelopment projects, urban locations or areas where resource area va uh, values are documented as severely degraded. Yeah, um, I think that's pretty solid. I just wanna make sure that the exceptions are tied those items and I think that they are but Leroy you feel like that the exceptions are in cases specifically when it's redevelopment urban degraded so that it that it's not just case by case basis it's, it's like contingent on those criteria. I think the same concern came to the same conclusion I think it's good the way it is uh, okay. specifically the word is and instead of or so it keeps it to those three cases. Okay. Again, if you guys have any ideas of how I can tighten that up, I'm all ears to suggestions. Um, this, I'm a little nervous about this and the reception that this is gonna receive, <laughs> but <clears throat> I think this I, is I love it. Yeah. It's consistent with what I've seen in other communities. I mean, mm -hmm. South Hadley has a 50 foot no touch. And you know, I um, think a point is that um, we're overdue for a review and revision and we're coming 
up to speed with what other towns have probably more recently determined. So um, if ours was different, we're modernizing and um, based on better understandings of impacts and et cetera. Like, I think that, um, I don't know for sure, but they well, perhaps have reviewed theirs more recently. It might make sense, you know, how we were talking about a PowerPoint sort of at the for at the at the starting gate before we even delve into going through section by section to point out exactly what you just said, Michelle. Like there are some changes here which expand our our sort of strengthen our jurisdictions a little bit and that there are reasonings and logic behind that. And this is what those reasonings are. Um, just to sort of prepare people <laughs> for this. <laughs> so just an idea. Yeah, or that changes were made on the, uh, you know, like on the basis of like greater understanding and experience, but also consultation with other town bylaws. Um, and um, the, in similar, like maybe maybe say which towns they are because it's not like they're anti-development towns or anything. They're towns with similar population sizes, similar call, you know, um, wetland conditions, et cetera. So yeah, that we have like a basis for this. Mm -hmm. I don't think we want to like come off the bat in a defensive standpoint. I think yeah. you know, we've really carefully considered all of this and just to relay how we did it, but not necessarily in a defensive point of view. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah, and I, I think to your point earlier, Michelle, um, the setbacks on a case by case basis. If there, if the applicant is requesting relief from some issue for some specific reason, um, I think that the commission can take that into consideration and um, the same way that the commission can expand its jurisdiction if it's concerned about impacts, the commission could also reduce its jurisdiction if it thinks that um, a given area is degraded and that, you know, a greater setback wouldn't be of benefit or that it wouldn't alter the resource area to have it smaller. So. Um, are you planning to, is that gonna be like a PowerPoint bullet or are you gonna sort of compose I that? that? Anyway, I would, I would put that in the introductory slides. Great, mm -hmm. thank you. Yep. Okay. Um, Some of these, some of the, there may have been some changes here um, from the previous um, wetlands administrator who had submitted some suggested revisions. Um, I didn't go through these ones um, to distinguish every, every single edit that was made, um, but we do have various, I, I mean, I have the version of the regs that she edited um, and that were edited by multiple folks in in the town hall before I arrived. Um, if if folks had questions about that, um, but there I didn't make any um, edits to these sections down below here. And that takes me to the end of this section. Great. It's significantly longer. Um, let me just see. I just want to just prepare you guys for the difference. Um, so the existing is 11 pages. And but a lot of that is um, clarification through the additions of Wetlands Protection Act. Right. Like just making it more complete. And adding in the entire riverfront section, which is huge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was and gonna say overall we're still running shorter significantly, considering how much we had. 
Yeah, I mean, I think we shortened some sections and expanded this section. And to me, this is the most important section of the document. Um, so I spent, this is like where I spent the bulk of my time. Um, so that is that. Um, did you guys want to, I, we've reviewed every section at this point and we've reviewed some sections multiple times. So I wasn't, I wasn't thinking that we were gonna revisit the other um, edited sections. Again, um, I put clean versions up on our website showing existing regs, changes made, and then the current um, sections. All of the sections have been reviewed by the town attorney at this point, with the exception of this one. So this is like our last section. Um, <clears throat> but if you guys feel compelled and have time and you want to look over those final revised sections and you have additional comments, please let me know. Um, again, we're coming up kind of close <laughs> to the hearing, so I'd like to finalize those as much as possible. There was one thing, which was the fee for emergency certifications, which I left in the $75 fee. Um, because I don't really want to press that issue or matter, but you guys know my feelings on that. Other than that, um, yeah. Um, that was like we had talked about um, where those funds go and how they're allocated. And if $75 is representative of like the administrative cost of the permit and the site visit. And I think that it probably is if you have to do a site visit, but. Um, 75 does seem like a lot. Um, it's more expensive than a certificate of compliance. And there's really no difference between a certificate of compliance other than the fact that an emergency cert is like high priority. You know, like if you get it, you have to respond within 24 hours. I see. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'd welcome other commissioners input on that one. Just I don't, I don't really have anything more to say except that you have a concern that hasn't really been addressed. So I, yeah. Yeah, um, I haven't really, to be totally honest, I haven't looked at what other towns charge for that permit. Um, but <clears throat> um, I just have a question about the sections that there were no edits to, like specifically limited projects. Um, is So what's the reason for not revisiting this? You just didn't see any need to, or just so I'm clear on um the sections that we haven't revised and why so limited projects are you familiar with limited projects michelle or should i give a little overview on that i mean i, th I think i've only had a very marginal experience with them in okay. my time okay so limited projects are um reserved under state law for very specific situations um, I'll give you some examples. So like town water and sewer, utilities, um, I think railroad, um, highway, like highway, mass highway, mass DOT. Um, and the reason is because a lot of those projects, because of the way that they're cited, they can't comply with the performance standards. So for example, um, like ever source doing right of way stuff. Exactly. So essentially, we just don't even have jurisdiction if it's a limited project. It's an exception. No, no. Um, it's just that there's a very clear process for it. So I'll give you an example. If an applicant is claiming a limited project status, they would note that on their application. They would say, we are a limited project. We're requesting the commission to consider this as a limited project. And then the commission would say, like, let's give this the straight face test. Is this really a limited project? And, and, and also, is this a situation where the applicant can't comply with the performance standards? Like, can something change with the plan design to help them to comply? Um, and so the commission has to determine it to be a limited project and it has to be determined that they can't comply with the performance standards in order for it to go forward. So there's sort of like a, 
a multi-step decision-making process that occurs with those projects and that's spelled out by the state. Now, my understanding from talking with KP Law on that and also on like the um, um, <clears throat> minor activities provisions is that we really shouldn't um, adjust those to be different from state law. And the reason for that is because they are specifically set up for entities who can't comply and also to give people relief in very minor situations. And so it just opens us up for like uh, litigation situations um, that we're overreaching um, our authority. And so like those particular cases, I don't, I don't usually, I mean, I, we look at them critically and I do look at limited projects critically, but at the same time, if they genuinely can't comply, you know, there's not a whole lot that you can do. So that's why those sections aren't edited. Um, thank you for that explanation. And so there may be, you know, not in the case of utilities or rail or something, is there some nexus with um, un like creating undue, what is it called um, when you create your own hardship? Um, self just so, yeah, self-imposed hardship. Um, um, like there, when somebody comes the limited project, I don't know if this is, would be like a homeowner or you know a developer or something, but is that under consideration? No, I mean, the only time that that, that I could really think that that might be is, um, so for example, like uh, the only thing that's springing to mind right now is a solar project. So because solar projects are so new that if, if somebody came before us and they said, we want to build a, you know, a solar field and they constructed their solar field. And then after the fact, they said, oh, but we want to put in these huge batteries right next to the river. Like, let's say that the project's constructed and everything's completed. But then three years later, after getting their certificate of compliance, they say, we want to put these big batteries right by this river here. That would be the only situation where it would be like a little bit of creating one's own hardship because they've recently developed the site and it would then qualify because it's a utility but then their siting is limited because of how they've developed does that make sense like they may have used every square foot of developable area to put in a solar farm and then that's restricted where they can put a battery three or ten years later because there's no more upland area on the site to put it but then they may say it's a limited project. Um, the commission still has the authority to say, no, this is not a limited project or no, we're not granting you limited project or we want you to comply with the performance standards. You guys still have the ability to do that under the regs. However, they could appeal that. Mm -hmm. So then in such a case, that would be up to commission to make sure that the plans approved account for such things, unforeseen things. I mean, that's sticky. I don't know what to think about that one. Yeah. But um, I just, I, I guess I'm just curious about how, yeah, the interaction between a situation like that and- I mean, and that's completely hypothetical. That's like, I'm trying to think yeah. of an example that speaks to what you're describing. Um, because like <laughs> Eversource has their utilities, like Mass Highway has their highways. Um, the railroad has their rail lines. Like it's, it's not like they're saying like, oh, we want to put in a new utility corridor. You know, that's a completely different situation. Um, so it's kind of difficult to pick an example out of um, <clears throat> agriculture would be an example, new agriculture. If somebody wanted to buy a property and create new agriculture, they might say that's a limited project there are very specific sections of the regs that apply to that, which are the exemptions. And new agriculture is not exempt, but it has different setback requirements. So for example, 
like in riverfront you can alter up to the first hundred feet of the riverfront with new agriculture versus single family home you can only alter up to 10 percent or 5,000 square feet whichever is greater on a lot created prior to August 6, 1996, or only 10% on a lot created after August 6, 1996. <laughs> See what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. there's le a less strict standard because it's agriculture. Okay, well, I, I mean, lots of, I guess, case by case consideration there. I was just curious as to our reasoning not to revisit it. Well, and the other thing to think about here is, and this is something that we haven't really talked about as a board, but situations like that, like the one I described with solar, that would be a good place to put in a condition on the order of conditions that states something to the effect of no more alteration is permitted on this site, period. Good to know, good to, you know, have that foresight and Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, I'm trying to think of our most recent example to make you feel better, Michelle, but I cannot remember for the life of me the property. But someone did come before us probably two months ago, Aaron, uh, that was looking to make something a limited project, and it clearly was not, and we just denied it. So it is possible. Uh, okay. Yeah. I was just, yeah, wondering. Um, or then I don't think we ended up denying the entire project. We denied the fact that it was a limited project and we made them go through a normal permitting process. Yeah, and I think, I'm not positive, Leroy, that may have been the bike path down on um, Mill Lane. They Could had requested be, yeah. a limited project status. And we did end up approving that and not requiring restoration. Um, so I think there was a little bit of wiggle room that was, you know, um, allowed, but we did require a bunch of plantings, as I recall, uh, native plantings around the proposed look off. So it was kind of like a balance, I think. At the end. Mm -hmm. But that's okay. a good example. Bike paths are limited projects. Hmm. Anyway, um, I don't want to take any more of your time because, you know, I think we, <laughs> this committee has been awesome, like as far as our time management is concerned. And I am, by the way, I'm like totally shocked that I was able to get this section <laughs> done by today. <laughs> I was like freaking out that I wasn't going to get it done. Um, but I do want to get it over to KP Law and I want to call Emily as soon as I can. And I don't want to hold you guys up any longer than we have to, because I think we've I think we have really exercised this thing really well. Yeah, this is our final meeting. Cool. Yes. Um, before I bid adieu then, uh, my homework is section B. What And you are sending this to KP Law. What is your requested timeline for my input? Is that contingent on anything? Okay, I'll just try and I mean, get it if to you, you try before to get it to meeting. If you could try to get it to Monday. Okay. By Monday, close of business, then at least Tuesday I have time to adjust if I okay. need to. Um, I don't it's I don't think that it has to be I don't think KP Law and Emily have to look at it after you look at it. I think you guys can all look at it and all I right. can just incorporate all the edits on Tuesday. Great. And well and read over riverfront section. That's a big right. one riverfront section just to make sure I didn't miss anything. I'm going to try to read through it again too. I was very rushed yesterday afternoon to get that done. Okay well thank you everybody. It's been really productive and educational and yeah. pleasure to work with you both. Um, I'm excited to see how it's received and excited for its implementation. Me too. <laughs> Which would be fairly quickly. I mean, once it's approved and once it's, uh, approved, it's into effect. Okay, um, that's great. it. Once once it's voted to approve it, um, presumably on May twenty fifth, it'll be it'll be official. Oh, it doesn't even have to be ratified by town council. Nope. Excellent. Just All a right. public hearing of the concom. Hmm. Just in time for the season. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, guys. All right. Thank you so much. And uh, I will see you. Have a look oh, out for markups. Okay. And PowerPoint. Bye, Bye guys. <laughs> Bye.